Welcome to the Startup Grind. So welcome everyone to Startup Grind. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest, Abdullah Zebin, CEO and co-founder of Lumba, the mobile-based gaming development studio based out of San Francisco and Dubai. After graduating from Harvard, Abdullah pursued a career in consulting and finance, working in international companies like Morgan Stanley, uh, Wafra Investment Firm, and MBK Capital. In 2012, Abdullah took a calculated leap and established Lamba, known today for games like Al Faza, or Tribal Clans in English, and Timsah Army, which got over 3 million downloads in the App Store and was voted as one of the best games in 2015 by the Apple Store. Tonight, inshallah, we'll be talking to Abdullah about his personal entrepreneurial journey with Lamba. Uh, the gaming industry dynamics, and discussing the all-round business development world in gaming and in general. Well, let's get started, Abdullah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so Ab Abdullah, you started a career in finance and then completely shifted towards building your own startup. What led you to make that shift? Um, first of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and talk, and thank you for the introduction. Um, I think the... There were a few reasons that, that led me to make this transition. I would say uh, uh, the first is my, my desire to switch from being an investor to, to an operator. And secondly, I felt that at the time in 2012, there was a, an interesting thing that's happening at the intersection of technology and media. And personally, I'm interested in both uh, spheres, and I felt that uh, I, I wanted to somehow be involved in that intersection. Uh, third, and, and lastly, I'm, I'm generally um, you know, very interested in, in what's going on in this part of the world, um, in this region, uh, in its, you know, its culture, its, its, its history. And I felt that there was a story that I wanted to tell, and I felt that games as a medium was, uh, was a great way to... to to apply that and and, uh, and 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 build something that speaks to that interest. I definitely agree with that. It's definitely a very uh, fertile market that loves storytelling, and it's good to capitalize on that. So, why did you choose to build a gaming startup? Was it a personal interest or an opportunity that you saw? It's a it's a bit of both. Uh, I would say then, uh, when I was growing up, of course, I was I was playing a lot of games. Not so much as of late. Any games uh, you liked in particular? Um, good question. I would say, you know, growing up, I, I went through the whole, you know, the phases of uh, Sakhar, Atari, that's back in the 80s. Uh, that was a vintage. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, transitioned into the Nintendo and console gaming and Game Gear and, and, and the Sega kind of uh, part. And I think I, that's, that's when, when things dropped off for me a little bit. Uh, but I was interested in, in games that had uh, a story to tell. You know, so uh, back back in the 80s, I would say Prince of Persia was was interesting, and 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 a few of the others. Um, but to, to to answer your question, it was both. Uh, I felt that um, gaming, having ha has taken 30 years to become uh, an interesting and interactive medium for the masses. I think in the 80s it started as being a niche um, kind of. Uh, platform that only a few house, households would have. 
Uh, and then in the 90s, we started to see the proliferation of, of gaming, having different companies doing different types of games. Um, but now, today, with, 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 with smartphones and tablets, uh, gaming is in everybody's pocket. And, and that's, that was partly the reason why I, I would say that vehicle drew me, drew me back to it, uh, why games started becoming more interesting to me again. Because now uh, you, can, you can tell a story and it doesn't have to be in film or it doesn't have to be in animation or it doesn't have to be in TV and cinema or theater. You could actually tell a story with games and you could reach the masses uh, through this new platform, this new paradigm, which is mobiles. Mobile so def devices. definitely yeah, loving to play a game and then establishing a company is two, two different things and establishing a company in Kuwait and establishing a company in San Francisco, something else. So maybe you can tell us about how it was like to set up a company in San Francisco. So I, I think I, I need to clarify how and why uh, we decided to set up in San Francisco. I, I lived in San Francisco. Uh, at the time, I was working there uh, for a company, and I uh, and I felt that at the time, thank you. Uh, at the time, I, I wanted to uh, make that transition. It just so happened that, that that decision to make the transition and the jump uh, happened when I was in San Francisco. Now that that helped me, I would say, tremendously, given the ecosystem in in, in Silicon Valley and in San Francisco is very conducive to starting companies, but also conducive to starting a gaming company. Uh, there were many, I would say, gaming studios in San Francisco and alums, uh, people who worked in those studios and have left, that, that I've benefit, benefited from. And I think the best example of that was the first day of starting Lumba, we went and we were working in a co-working space, similar to Sardab Labs, and uh, two gentlemen that I was sitting next to, young men, um, just left the gaming company that they had started. They sold it some, to, to some company and they were starting something new. And coincidentally, you know, we were sitting next to them and we started talking and I was telling them about the vision of what we wanted to do with Lumba and they were very interested and they came on as advisors. They helped me in the beginning, you know, to, to avoid the mistakes that they have done. Uh, and and, and they've, that, that advice has been very valuable. So back to your question, um, being in San Francisco was, was of tremendous help, but I wouldn't say it was the main reason um, that, that helped us kind of set up Lumba correctly or propel us to where we are today. I think it, there are other reasons and other, other factors that we could discuss, I think, in, in a bit. So it's definitely like the scenario, the right place at the right time. And uh, that actually brings me to the other question. Uh, who is the team behind Lumba? Any of the founders, your team size today? So Lumba was, I would say, um, was conceived um, by myself and, and one of our anchor investors. Uh, I, when, I, when I moved to San Francisco in 2010, I, um, I met a gentleman whose name is uh, Ali Diab. Ali is a, a Syrian-American, uh, grew up in Palo Alto, went to, studied in Stanford, worked in Yahoo and Microsoft. He's, he's, he's about 10 years older than me. And, um, and I established a very good friendship with this gentleman, and we started talking about different ideas. So when, when the idea of doing something in entertainment and media came about, you know, I was... I, I was discussing it with, with Ali and he, having seen it uh, in, in his, his different experiences in the past before, you know, when we were talking, he was about to leave the company that he helped start, which was called AdMob. AdMob is the first advertising mobile platform which uh, he helped fund and then he was, uh, you know, he was the head of product with them and then they sold to Google in 2010. And so around that time, we were having this conversation and you know, I was telling him about this thesis about, um, about Lumba and what I was seeing in this market, which is a very young population, 70% of the population in the Middle East and North Africa is under the age of 30. Uh, under the age of 30. Uh, there is about 250 million mobile users. And then the Arabic content is actually, uh, was, was quite scarce. So we, so we thought, I thought that games was, was perhaps a, a great uh, way to, to, to get into this market. And Ali, you know, was, was extremely supportive. I mean, we deliberated this idea, this, is, this discussion and this thesis for a few weeks. And then he finally said, look, you know, if you, if you want to quit your, your job, I'm, I'm happy to, to write you your first check and help you set up Lumba. And uh, I think it's finding someone who's like that, to, who's, who's, who has that um, sort of... That, that, take that leap. Yeah, that would help you take that leap, has the kind of... Uh, 
the support network that will get you going and and uh, and will guide you through the sort of the, the deep waters of entrepreneurship. I think that's that's very important and seminal. So, in a gaming company, what does the team cons consist of? So, you have the developers, the designers, the management team. Can you talk to us more about that. Yes, yeah, it's, it's actually it's a, it's quite a simple structure. Um, usually, in a team uh, that develops a game, you have a, a product manager, who's someone who's someone who basically sets the vision for the title or the game or the product, uh, puts the idea together, does the research in the market, sees what's potentially going to work and what's not. And then he has essentially two, two other teams that he works with. He has the art, the creative team, and then the engineering team. Um, the, the art team, uh, for us, is, it's very small. It's two gentlemen who, who are currently based in San Francisco, an art director and a junior artist. and uh, Whenever they need help, they have flex support from outsourced a network of outsourced artists that we work with. Um, with engineering, uh, it's it's a little bit more complicated. You have a technical product manager that that leads that team, and then it's a team that's split into two. We have front end engineers who who basically write the code for whatever whatever is on the device itself, and then you have the back end or the server engineers who write the code for. Uh, for the infrastructure that supports the game. And bringing all of this together as the CEO, can you walk us through the process in handling the team and the project management in general, especially having two multiple locations in San Francisco and Dubai? Yeah, and, and, and actually our, our third team is in Vietnam. The software engineering team is in Vietnam. Um, it used to be emails and, and many emails. Uh, I would say you know, every day I would wake up to 100 emails that I have to go through. So half of my day is, is replying to emails. But thankfully now we're using Slack. Slack is, uh, I would say, the, 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 the improved version of IRC. I don't know if any of, I'm sure some of the audience have, have used IRC back in the 90s. But uh, it's, it's essentially the same infrastructure as IRC, but has been beautified to be used for enterprises, for teams that work in different locations. So Slack uh, as, as a tool has been very helpful for us. And then supporting that, you know, of course, we have the whole infrastructure on the cloud, so Dropbox uh, and, 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 and everything that goes behind it. That's perfect. I personally use Slack, and I can vouch for that. It's very useful. All right. Uh, where do you find talent? Talent is something that's very scarce to find. So where do you find talent, and what qualities do you look for in developers and designers? Um, so I, I, um, when it comes to talent, I, I've, what has worked for me was... Uh, was was taking, was working with people who, or at least leveraging my network of people to give me references. Um, I found that references have usually worked uh, a lot better, and I would say an order of magnitude better than than reaching out to someone cold who you don't know and and, and working with them. Now, not to say that every reference works very well, but people that make introductions on your behalf, people who you know, that say, "Well, I've I've worked with." A, B, and C, and I recommend B because he is X, Y, and Z, uh, is, uh, is definitely a lot, helps you vet the candidate in a much better way than, than you know, going to, uh, to Elance or any of the platforms to, to just hire someone from there directly. Not to say that doesn't work, um, but just in my experience, I've, I've found that um, you know, talking to people in my network and letting them do their refer referrals has worked very well. So basically, posting job postings on LinkedIn or Monster.com or places like that, or maybe even going to competitions uh, to scout talent. Do you do these kind of things, or do you see that references work better? We do. We do actually. Um, we post a job post on LinkedIn, on Stack Overflow, on GitHub, especially when it comes to engineering, mm -hmm. uh, and we look for talent. Uh, you know, our talent on uh, Carbon Made. Um, uh, and a few other websites that are more design focused and art focused. We haven't done the actual the competitions, and I think that's that's an interesting one to do, because uh, at least in the gaming industry, game jams and other competitions help you just uh, try see someone and 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 assess their technical chops without really having to take the risk of uh, taking them on. Um, but regardless, whenever we bring in someone, um, either someone who we plan to hire full time or someone who we work as a contractor, we always have a two to four week trial period. We give them a small task, a contained project, and see how they 
how they perform within it. And if they hit the right uh, you know, milestones and they, and they deliver, deliver a good product, then it means that, that he's someone that we'd like to invest or she is someone we'd like to invest in. That's perfect. So integrate them into the team. Um, can you walk us uh, through your creative process, maybe? Yeah, so it's, it's uh, I don't know if it's, if it's process or organized chaos when it comes to creativity, but I have to say that perhaps in recent years we have come to understand how, uh, what it takes to build a game. Um, when I first started Lumba in 2012, the process was really, I would say, very, very uh, rudimentary. Um, our first game, Sultan al-Sahara Desert Tycoon, was selfishly a game that I built uh, on, on, a, on a show that I grew up loving, Darbuzelik. And I thought, uh, and I thought that's, this was a story that I would like to tell in the form of a game, very loosely. Um, so so that, that, that led kind of the creative process of, of developing that game. And uh, you know, we worked with um, artists in the US and San Francisco who are American who don't know much about our culture. And I was literally sitting down with them watching Darbuzelik you know, for hours uh, every day, which was fun, but I don't think they enjoyed it as much. Um, but then, you know, the second game with, with Feza, the, uh, the inspiration was actually, you know, it was, 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 was coupled between two different uh, pieces of content. Uh, what I saw in 2013 was, was something that was interesting happening in, in a TV show that was, that was being taped in Abu Dhabi. It's called Sha'ar al Malyon. And Sha'ar al Malyon uh, was, was basically a poet's death jam. Uh, that was that was taking place in, uh, in I think in Abu Dhabi and in Dubai, and it it got a huge audience uh, and a very young audience too, and and we thought that there was an interesting dynamic that we wanted to play on that because what it did was it teased out certain uh, cultural kind of uh, uh, um, interests I think in that audience you know that that sense of pride that sense of um, you know history, that sense of, uh, you know, really going back to your roots. And, and we thought that was an interesting dynamic to play off of. But secondly, I would say the second piece of content that inspired that second game was one of my favorite films, was uh, Lawrence of Arabia. And uh, be, besides it being a beautiful film, it was a story that was taking place in an interesting time in this, in this part of the world. Uh, you know, after, I would say, around World War One, where a lot of politics and what we're seeing today is it was a result of that. So again, you know, it's, it's a product of my selfish interest in certain uh, pieces of content that have led me, or at least led the creative process, uh, more so than me kind of um, sort of trying to, to, to read too much into what the market wants. Um, I would say as of late, we're trying to take a little bit of a more calculated approach. So we are, you know, now that we have an audience, we have a user base, we, we listen to them, we see what kind of stories and content they enjoy. But we really don't want to let go of that piece which, which we like, which is what is the story that we want to tell. And as long as that story is interesting to us, we think that it will be interesting to our audience. I definitely agree. So instead of responding to your surroundings, you're actually proactively engaging in the community and finding what's the next trend. Which brings me to my next question. Uh, what trends do you see unfolding in the game development industry, in the region and globally? Well, it's, it's becoming um, a lot more competitive, I would say, in developed markets. So in the US, um, what was in place in 2009 was very different than what's taking place today. Um, you know, back then, uh, any, any, I would say, any developer that developed on games uh, on, uh, on mobile as a platform had a chance to, to make it big. Today, um, you have big studios with big budgets that you know, make three to five million dollars a day in revenue uh, that are just you know, dominating the charts. Um, that's not the case here in this part of the world. I mean, it's, this is, I see this as, a, as, as still a relatively nascent and, and growing market and, um, and the opportunity to to develop something that's unique to your audience here is, uh, is, is a lot more, sp I would say, um, it's a lot more uh, you know, visible as, as opposed to if it w uh, in, in developed markets of the US and Europe or, or even Asia. Um, 
So what, what's happening in, in more of the mature markets is that we're seeing a consolidation in most of these studios. So the smaller studios have realized that they can't survive and they're putting themselves up to sale. In emerging markets, we're seeing, you know, it's a lot more fluid and we're experiencing it ourselves. So, you know, the first two years uh, since the inception of Lumba from 2012 to 2014, we really didn't have much, of, uh, much competition. I mean, when we released our first game, I think we were the first game titled in Arabic, actually, in, in most of the app stores. Um, but after we released Feza, we started to see the shift, this inflection point taking place in this market because the market has evolved and has become a lot deeper. Um, people's willingness to spend has certainly changed. Um, and we're starting to notice that there is more competition um, from outside. So the big studios such as Supercell and, and others are starting to translate their games into Arabic. Which is for us, it's it's a it's a it's a big validation point, and uh, we actually welcome it because it helps us grow the market. I don't think it's uh, it's it's not a zero sum game. So actually, a, a lot of companies are being established right now because of the increased competition because they're following the money. But what business metrics do game developers need to focus on to basically measure that? Uh, key performance indicators and their success rates? It's a very good question because games, uh, especially mobile games, it's, it's a very analytical and, and data-driven business. Uh, and I can't, I can't really um, emphasize that enough, to be honest with you, because we, we do so much in trying to understand not just what, what the user you know, wants, but also how we keep the user engaged. So the main metrics that we look at are retention rates, we look at average revenue per daily average user, uh, we look at where users drop off. So we, and, and most of this is done by free tools that we use, by the way. It's not like we're developing our own analytics engines in the back, uh, in the back end. Um, so you know, part of running a gaming business is also running a data business, it's also running a marketing business. Um, you know, it, it's, it's running a service business, especially if your games are online games like ours. Uh, so, just walk us through or just tell us a brief about what makes a game successful with regards to the mechanics of gameplay or the interface controls. So, how do you gain that traction? I think th there are a few things that make a game successful. Partly it's, it's the story, right? I think that, that's something that we understood very early on. Second is the mechanics, like you mentioned. You know, what does the user do? What, you know, how do you take them through that journey of having a delightful experience every time they turn on the game? Um, but third, it's, it's, it's marketing and distribution. Uh, unfortunately, that's something that every gaming studio should be thinking about. And I'm not saying that this is something that you have to have uh, sort of a, a very... Uh, strong financial backing to do. There are creative ways to market your games. Uh, but it certainly has to be top of mind uh, when, when you think about building your product and your game and, and, and launching, it, launching it and maintaining it. You basically, the last word you said was retaining it. So basically retaining users is an issue with applications and games alike. Basically, once someone downloads a game, I definitely downloaded a lot of games that I played once or maybe half a game and I just deleted the, the app. So how do you retain the users? What makes you make them come again and again and again? It's, uh, you know, part of selling something that's free is the expectation that people are just not going to use it uh, after their first day of using it. So, you know, I could share some of the metrics that we see in the industry, uh, at least with free games. 50% of users that download the first the, a free game don't come back and play it after the day they download it. So they delete it within a day. Um, so it's that, that remaining 50% and what you can do with it, which is very important. So we, we religiously track uh, retention rates from day one to day 30 to th day, day 90 to make sure that what we're doing is right. And every 1% that we're able to retain, you know, just feeds off very well uh, in the long term. What do we do? Uh, there are a few things, you know, having fresh content, you know, updating your characters, updating your assets uh, on a regular basis is one. Uh, the second is having a very active uh, customer or player experience team. Uh, and that means uh, being so very active on social media, answering uh, complaints and, and questions uh, promptly. Building a community around your game, I think, is, is, a, 
is a very strong uh, retention mechanism that we emphasize and, 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 and we, we, we do on a regular basis. And on that note, actually, we have a team of about eight college students that work with us part-time uh, across the region, um, uh, guys and girls, and, uh, and they, they help us uh, with, with answering, uh, basically interacting with our players. Because what we realized is there is no better way to interact with your customer than having someone who is like them to interact with them. So they actually play in the game? For the so they, they play in the game, but they also they answer their questions on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. Uh, we have an in-game uh, customer service uh, portal so they could send messages to our customer team and they get answers within six hours. Um, so we, 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 we basically put a huge emphasis in, in the player experience uh, and, and making sure that they, even you know, if they, they face any problems, that it's addressed promptly and, and they, you know, they enjoy the experience of interacting with any of our uh, team members. Let's move on to something that's really important, which you stressed actually, which is marketing. And you, we know that mobile game marketing is a really competitive industry and a creative one too. What are the, some of the most successful marketing campaigns that you've led? I'm, I'm glad you, you touched on that because I, I feel like marketing, especially in gaming, is a, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an art, but also it's a science. Uh, science in, in that um, there's just, like I said, there's a lot of analytics that goes into it. You have every dollar we spend marketing to users, we track every single do dollar. We, we make sure that it's more than a dollar uh, on the other end. So if it's making less than a dollar, then we kill whatever campaign we're doing or we kill um, you know, wh whatever channel that we're using to, to market that campaign. So um, you know, numbers and data is extremely important. Um, but it's also an art because you have, to, um, you have to put something that attracts your audience. Um, so the creatives that we put, uh, the images, or the, the animated clips or the videos that we make um, have to speak to that audience and they have to, it has to get their attention because um, there's just a lot of noise out there in different social media channels and, um, and really the most interesting survives uh, when it comes to marketing. So you know, how do you get your message across and get the user to download your game? Um, you know, it, it's something that changes and it's not static, it changes I, I've been doing it myself for the past year, of course, with this one, one other gentleman that helps me. Um, but I, I would say every month there's something new that we have to adapt to. So it's, it's quite dynamic. Within the past year, and especially the end of the past year, I've seen personally a lot of uh, websites and applications being uh, advertised using platforms like Facebook ads, Google AdWords, and YouTube ads. Do you, have you used these kind of platforms and what are your experiences with them? Yes, we have actually, um, it's interesting for us, um, the most successful channel that, uh, that has worked for us is Twitter. Um, you know, we use Instagram, we use YouTube, we use Facebook, and we use traditional ad networks. Um, but we found Twitter to be uh, very effective, at least in this part of the world. I think most of uh, the audience that we're going after, and especially in our games, right now our games are more mostly targeted to where, towards male, between 16 to 32, I would say, or 30. Um, and we find, we find that uh, you know, approaching them on Twitter works very well. Um, with YouTube, we've actually done some experimental campaigns. Um, we've, we've collaborated with, a, um, with an interesting and, and, and very funny animated, uh, rather animation studio in, in Riyadh. And the animator's name is Malik, uh, Malik Nijr. He makes a uh, a very famous um, series on YouTube called Miss Amir. And so we've, uh, we've worked with them actually on, on a few of our campaigns, and those have worked very well. Um, but you know, we still find that Twitter is, is, uh, is quite effective. Surprisingly, Instagram hasn't worked as well as we thought it would. Um, but what I've learned from, from doing this is you need to understand who your audience is and go to your audience. So. On Instagram, we believe that fashion, food and beverage, uh, cosmetics, beauty works very well on that platform as opposed to gaming. Um, Facebook has worked very well for us, I would say a year ago, less so over the last six months. Uh, YouTube, 
is interesting and entertaining, but it's usually people who are looking for visual entertainment as opposed to interactive entertainment. Uh, I have a personal question to ask you. The uh, user base, the gamers on your games, uh, are they mostly in the region concentrated in a, in a country or a region, like for example the Gulf countries? Yes, uh, so uh, the breakdown of our user base is 60% uh, Saudi, about 10-15% Kuwait, 10-15% UAE, and then the rest is between Bahrain, Qatar, and Oman. And, um, and there is something that we did actually about a year ago, uh, which was uh, marketing the game to Arabic-speaking uh, players and users around the world. So we thought that the, the Arab uh, <coughs> diaspora in Canada and the US and Western Europe and Australia is an interesting one to go after. So we've been actively promoting our games for them and we've actually um, have, have built actually a, a good audience uh, base uh, uh, out there. So trans, uh, you've, you've talked about something that games have been translated from English to Arabic to attract the user base. What about the other way around, like uh, translating Arabic games into English? We have. I mean, we, we've tried uh, pushing um, Feza, tribal rivals, in the U.S. and Canada. And we actually have, we have some, some of our most active users are um, men and women, uh, you know, middle-aged men and women in, in the U.S., in, in Britain. And, uh, you know, they email us and they ask us, like, they, they love the, the story, they love the art, they love the cultural kind of angle that we, that we play. Um, so we, we do see them. It's just that we don't see them in, in masses. And I think it's just a question of time um, until people are interested or get that or orientalist you know, fever that many had, I would say, 30 or 40 years ago. As a final question on my end, uh, what advice can you give entrepreneurs who want to start a successful startup? And keeping in mind the problems you've tackled and things that you've done. It's a good question. Um, you know, success is not an entitlement. I think that's that's one thing that um, has I kept in mind. Um, you know, when we started uh, Lumba, we really it was not really. I mean, everybody wants to succeed, but we had a question that we wanted to answer, right? And we did whatever it took to answer that question, and really applied it. You know, we had the thesis, and we want to apply that thesis. You know, with a product that would help us prove or disprove that thesis. Um, Desert Tycoon Sultan of Sahara was financially wasn't a success by the way uh, you know we, we broke even maybe we lost actually a few on it but uh, it was a success in helping us validate what the market wants so we learned a lot from that product um, but it didn't it didn't make the returns that we were we have hoped for but what I learned in the process of building that game um, having not built a game before um, is that besides the difficulty of build, building something as technical as that, you know, there's only one person that can know the market uh, and, 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 and can uh, prove if this market is worth going after or not, and it's you. And so you, you should take that experience uh, very seriously as opposed to trying to you know, listen to advice that comes to you left and right as you're going through that process. Um, so I'll get to that to that point in a second. But I, what I wanted to touch on there is, you know, in my experience of, of building our first game, I went through a cycle that um, I think many entrepreneurs go through, which is when you start, you start with this false or rather uninformed optimism. Uh, you're excited about something, um, but you're really uninformed. I mean, you're 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 very naive about what lies ahead. And in the process of doing it, building it, launching it you get beaten, and, and beaten very harshly, financially, uh, morally, um, you know, reviews, you, you name it. You, you go through these motions. And most of the time, you probably, you know, you feel like what you have done is an absolute failure. What's important, though, is during that process, those failures are actually lessons. And at the deepest part of the cycle, which I, I call is like, you know, the, the deepest part of going you know, from, from this in, uh, uninformed optimism to basically semi-informed pessimism is getting through that process. Because what you want to get to, you know, the, the other end of the cycle is informed optimism. Because then you have learned so much about the market and it's up to you whether you want to 
to, to, to invest in it and double down and be persistent, or you want to give up and walk away. And this is essentially what happened to us you know, 18 months into Lamba. Uh, you know, I had uh, Sultan al-Sahra, Desert Tycoon. Um, the game wasn't doing well financially. I was completely burnt out, uh, having done this for 18 months, working every single day with no weekends for a year and a half. Um, and I was very close to walking away. But then I took a step back and I thought, well, what is it that we can learn from this? And, and there were some great lessons, but also some very encouraging signs that helped sort of switch this pessimism, pessimism into optimism for me. And that's when I decided to essentially invest in building Feza, which took about a year and a half to build. But you know, with the moral support of investors, of family, um, you know, we were able to get through. And then when we, you know, we launched Fazal, alhamdulillah, it was, it was a success. So, you know, I think the common thread here is uh, something that many entrepreneurs perhaps, um, you know, forget in their journey is an undervalued or rather underappreciated uh, trait of any successful entrepreneur is persistence. Uh, if you have persistence and, and you have conviction in what you're doing, then things will play out at some point. But you have it's the, you know, the onus or the responsibilities on you to make sure that what you're doing is right. And if the market is giving you bad signals, then you should walk away. But if it's giving you some good signals, then it's a question as to whether you want to continue or not. Thank you very much. I'll open the stage now to, for any questions that you guys have. We gave a lot of attention to the part related to the story and the culture behind the games. Mm -hmm. Now, we're also ga seeing games uh, going into areas like education and also virtual reality going into healthcare in terms of areas like treatment of patients for depression and other diseases. Where do you see yourself, the gaming industry, going in terms of tackling new areas? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because, um, you know, we, we, we're experimenting with virtual reality a little bit. I think it's a platform that's going to take time. Um, but we're also interested in new platforms uh, such as Apple TV or the Google Chrome TV. Uh, we think that the TV has regained its relevance, I think, uh, w with the introduction of these, uh, these devices. Um, virtual reality is interesting. Actually, we have a VR set at, at the office and we're experimenting with a, few, with a few ideas that we have. But it's going to take a while to, to uh, change customer behavior. And I think, uh, you know, as, as, as a business or as an entrepreneur, you have you can pick one battle, and you don't want to pick the battle where you're trying to change uh, you know, customer behavior in any way. Let the market do that for you. Um, but yes, I mean, we, we do see some changes, uh, you know, at least you know, some semblance of, of interesting new platforms that come through. But within mobile gaming, within smartphones and tablets, there are new ways that are pushing technology into new frontiers. So I would say five years ago there was doing a, a constantly online game was difficult, but now the infrastructure is there. Um, and what we're seeing today is more real-time online games that are becoming uh, more and more prevalent between two, two users that are playing in real time. So it's just, it's just adapting to what, what, you know, what, what's happening, I guess, in the infrastructure around your technology. Um, I want to ask you, are you planning to expand your niche from, let's say, maybe other regions like Morocco, Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, or even other gender like females games? Absolutely. Um, that, that's a great question. For us, um, the GCC, the reason we focused on the GCC was because we felt the infrastructure was there and we wanted to invest in that. Um, at least you know, whatever games we wanted to build, we wanted to, to go to a market that is ready to... to uh, to adopt these games. Um, North Africa is a very interesting market to us, for us, especially Egypt. Um, it's just a question of time until that market comes online, and it's going to happen within the next two, two or three years. Uh, the same with the Levant. I think there is just uh, an interesting pocket of, of, of users that w and, and, uh, and games that we could develop for, for that audience. Female is absolutely you know, top of mind, and we actually you know, our games that we're building today is just half of them. We're, we're just addressing half of the market, which is the male. We think the female audience and the female market is, is, is a very interesting one. Um, but we also want to make sure that whatever games that we develop uh, are of interest to, to, to that demographic. 
in our understanding of the female audience is they're a lot more cerebral, cerebral, more intellectually driven. So you know, thinking about games that sort of tease out the sort of that angle of of of, uh, of playing as opposed to you know the angle that we play with, or at least we we design for for the male audience, um, is something that will take a little bit of time, but it's definitely in our product pipeline. Uh, hi, uh, I was. Um, question is, you know, fear of failure is an obstacle that many startups fail, uh, startups uh, experience. And you said you had some struggles. I was wondering, did you experience this, and how did you overcome it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when 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 we started Lumba, um, it was bootstrapped between myself and my business partner, and it's not like we had you know too much cash to run with. Uh, you know, I didn't pay myself a salary for a year and a half. Um, you 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 essentially have, you put you know you you take a big risk in in building any startup um, but you know I, I i there's a i think there's a misconception about failure that people have or at least risk i think good good entrepreneurs take calculated risks so they understand you know what's the upside but also how they should they could control the downside um you can't blindly take a risk or blindly do something thinking that's going to work out. And uh, at least the, the, entre the entrepreneurs that I've met uh, here and in, in Dubai and San Francisco, um, the ones that have done well have, have a, a very good read about you know, uh, what risks to take and which ones not to take. Um, so, so that's one. Second, it's, it would be great if you could take these calculated risks that allow you to have these small failures as you go. Everything that we do is, you know, begins as a failure, but somehow transitions into, you know, it continues to become a failure and we stop it, or it transitions into something successful. It's just, you know, how do you position yourself to learn from, from that failure? So as you take on anything that you do, what's really important is making sure that you have, you know, questions that you want to answer. And as you're doing it, whether it becomes successful or not, you make sure that you answer these questions. What you come out of doing that exercise, what you, what you come out realizing or learning is one, you know, these are lessons that I could apply that could turn around this product to make it successful. Or two, you know, these are le lessons I could apply at a later point when this product is probably more mature. Um, so it's, it's really, it's all about approaching um, any decision that you take with a set of questions that you want to answer. Abdullah. Um, so you've had your share of uh, virtual reality or MMOGs, but I'm sure you're also equally exposed to casual gaming, which is also a huge part of gaming, especially in our part of the world. But how do you see the publishing industry and in gaming going casual versus mmogs over reality well i think casual is much bigger than uh, than hardcore games um, you know when we started with, with sultan sahra it was a it was a casual city building game that everybody played um, i mean i'm sorry let me let me take that back i wouldn't say everybody but the the makeup of our player base was was a lot more diverse than it is now uh, i would say it was almost half uh, female and half male, um, and people enjoyed playing that game because it was relatively more casual than strategy war games. Um, the thing about casual, strictly casual games, like uh, you know, I would say um, Angry Birds or the arcade games, is they're actually more difficult to to monetize than other games. Uh, I think Candy Crush has changed that formula a bit by by uh, by making sort of the the algorithm behind it just so compelling that people want to come back continue playing and paying but i find it very difficult to find uh, casual games to do as well as as, as candy crush um, but reality of it is that you're since you have a much bigger audience today you're basically your 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 target audience is everyone that has a mobile device um, you know, going with something casual has um, kind of a propensity to to be downloaded by a lot more people than going with something that is less casual and more hardcore. 
unfortunately, you know, the money is with the hardcore uh, at the moment. Uh, but we're seeing at least some signs that you know, casual is coming back and becoming an interesting kind of uh, genre of gameplay that you can monetize. Okay, I guess it's me. Now that you have um, captured people between the 16 to 30 range, okay, what do you have for the 30 range and up? Because yes. now you have them hooked, yes. but after a while, they're going to have their taste is going to change and needs are going to change. No, that's that's a great question. Um, it's interesting to see what what has happened in more of the developed markets. So if you look at the U.S. Uh, farming games or 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 SimCity type of games uh, have a very different um, audience than perhaps the audience that we have here in this part of the world. Most of the players of uh, farming games in the U.S. are uh, women, um, middle-aged, I would say, women, and uh, and it, for them, it's it's interesting what, why they play these games. You have to understand the psyche of your audience uh, and, and design for that. And for that demographic, it's it's basically an escape from everyday reality. So for them, it's you know having a world that they can control, a world that a world they could organize, a world that they can you know that that no one can interrupt. And that, that's an interesting because you know mo most uh, most of what building games is is uh, is actually behavioral psychology. We actually we we, we do a lot of that. We read uh, behavioral economic theories. We, we apply uh, psych sort of psychological psychological theories as we design and build games, because that's that's essentially how you build games that retain users. Um, but to your question, going back to your question about. Uh, the the other segment of the of the population that would love to play games that are perhaps more attenuated to them, uh, this is something again that we're thinking about alongside, uh, you know, building more and more female attenuated games, and again, you know, we we find that that portion of the population is definitely wants something that's more intellectually stimulating, uh, that's that's engaging and fun, but also competitive. Um, so hopefully, we'll see something over the next eighteen months. Hi, back here. Uh, in terms of um, market size, uh, everyone agrees that mobiles are more prevalent in the market, so your so your reach is there. But in terms of revenue, it's still with PC gaming, uh, where the where the big money is. And do you see this trend shifting? And how do you plan on um, accommodating for oh, that? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. We we're definitely seeing that shift. Um, uh, look at look at um, gaming companies that have traditionally been PC gaming companies, doing a, doing acquisitions in, in mobile gaming companies. Uh, Activision Blizzard, you know, they just acquired uh, King.com. They make uh, Candy Crush, and a host of other big gaming companies uh, that have done very well in, in PC and browser games, and would like to make the, make that transition to mobile. Mobile gaming today worldwide makes about 95 billion dollars a year in, in revenue um, and it's and it's growing at it's growing at, at a fast clip um, about 10 to 20 percent per annum um, so you, you can you can make you can do the math but uh, today you have two billion uh, mobile users and you have six or seven billion population uh, you know just doubling sort of your user base is something that's within reach it's not uh, completely uh, it's not. It's not a completely a foreign idea, uh, and you know when when people buy devices, what, what's the first thing they do? Uh, they look for entertainment. So so games is is uh, is definitely a, a, a formidable platform. Okay, another question here. Uh, back to mobile apps in general, not games in specific. Of course, it was an idea before at the beginning. And I believe each one of us might have another idea for another app. But I want to know how exactly you went through the protection of your copyrights while building this game. Because you know online there are many apps that will, will appear, will be equivalent to your idea at the beginning. So how you went through this and how did you overcome it? Look, unfortunately, and I think fortunately or unfortunately, when it comes to the idea itself, you can't really copyright the idea. Um, it's very difficult to... to uh, to protect that, what you can copyright is the brand. Uh, so for us, with uh, with Feza or Lumba, you know, we've we've taken steps at least not the beginning because we didn't have the financial means to do that, but more recently to 
file for copyrights and trademarks for on certain brands. But honestly, you know, there's only so much that copyrights can do. I mean, your product speaks for itself, and if your product is good, then people will download it as opposed to that of the competition. So for entrepreneurs to be so caught up in trying to protect their idea or their IP and investing their time and resources in doing that, I think it's, uh, it's, the, wrong, it's the wrong battle to, uh, to, to engage in. I think there are bigger things that you can focus on. Um. So a question for you. So you, lum, lum, I spoke about psychology. and I have, know. I have, know. You uh, fell right into that trap. So speaking of lumbas, you know, they say the, the, the question is, how many therapists does it take to change a light bulb? Do you know, do you know the answer to that one? Maybe one. It's probably nine from Tawai. Well, no. no. One, but the light bulb really has to want to change, right? So in terms of your experience, you mentioned burnout, and you kind of just casually went through to everything else. How did you deal with that? How did you know you were burned out? And what steps did you take towards changing? So that you don't get burned out in the future, or at least you know what you know the the other side, the soft side of kind of the, uh, being an entrepreneur. I think a big part of uh, for first-time entrepreneurs, there's just a lot of uh, unknowns. Um, so you try to overcompensate by just uh, plowing more time, uh, and you know working 14-hour days, uh, day in day out, and not taking care of yourself personally. Um, and then I think in the process of doing that, you get to understand or at least uncover these unknowns. So there are, you know, not to sound like Rumsfeld, but, you know, there are the known unknowns and unknown knowns or, or whatever it is. Um, but, but you get to understand what, you know, requires your time and what doesn't and how to allocate your time. And I think a big part of being an entrepreneur is just efficient use of your time, efficient allocation of your time. Um, second is... is uh, is being able to delegate. I think, again, you know, when you start something new, you want to do everything. But then at some point you realize you can't do everything. It's, it's a team effort, it's, it's teamwork. Um, so having the trust in your team, having the trust in yourself to kind of let them kind of run uh, with, with certain parts of, uh, of, of your company and, and, and putting that trust in them is, is part of taking that pressure off of you. Um, on the personal side, I think having the social and, and, and family support, and, and, and in support, I mean moral support, is absolutely critical. I mean, uh, every time I feel like I want to walk away from it, uh, you know, I have someone to talk to and converse with, and, 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 and be it friends, be it business partners, be it family, that could you know, bring you back uh, and, and, and help you kind of uh, you know, step away from it and look at it, look at the big picture. Because it's easy as an entrepreneur to be very caught up in the, in the weeds, in the details. And the details can, 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 can really, I think, drain you, I think, uh, as, as, you, as you take this on. So uh, being able to kind of force yourself to step back, having a support network that helps you step back and, and think about things, uh, internalize things, and, and look at the big picture is part of the process of, you know, at least for me, of transitioning from feeling that I was burnt out, that I can't do it anymore, to, to taking on and, and doubling down on this bet that I've taken. I have two questions, if you don't mind. The first one is that you've been in San Francisco for five years now. When you look at the ecosystem in the region, incubators, accelerators, uh, VCs, everything, what is it you feel that we're missing the most in the Middle East? What are the aspects that you see in San Francisco that you don't see here? So like the top two things that you see are missing in the uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem in the region, in the Middle East region. Look, and I think it's difficult to really match what's going on in Silicon Valley, but it's not impossible. I think there are three things that make, it, make, make that ecosystem very vibrant uh, in, in San Francisco or in the Bay Area. One is... Um, uh, you know, institutions that uh, churn out excellent technical talent uh, in volumes. So you have Berkeley and Stanford that have kind of led the way of, of basically just bringing to the market uh, software engineers that are able to build products. And I think that's an important anchor in any ecosystem. And actually, venture capitalists, one of the first questions they ask when they go and invest in a market they don't understand is how many universities are there and how good are their, are, are their uh, computer science programs uh, because they want to know just how big the talent pool is and it's indicative of that. 
secondly, having a, um, a good judicial system, a legal framework. Uh, you know, when, when we set up Lumba, it literally, I mean, it took us about 24 hours to set up the company with zero capital, right? And I, was, I didn't have to even show up in person to sign any document. We just delegated the, the lawyer to do it on our behalf. And, you know, overnight we had the company. Um, compare that to the process of setting up a, a company anywhere in this part of the world where you have to put paid in capital, uh, you know, personal guarantees, you know, the paperwork uh, that goes into setting up the company. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it takes off, it, it takes so much of your energy and your resources and your financial means uh, to, to, to go into this venture even before you start the venture itself. So the legal framework definitely plays into it. And third, uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, not, not a trivial uh, uh, part of the system is, of course, the, the, the capital. Uh, I think, uh, you know, with venture capital, it's essentially risky capital. And what venture capitalists, I would say, in the Bay Area have understood is when they invest, they're investing in a portfolio. They're not investing in, in one company. Um, so, you know, the company that they invest in is part of a greater subset of companies they've invested in. It could be in the same industry or it could be in other industries. But, you know, whenever they take a bet, it's a calculated bet that's part of a portfolio. I, I don't see that as much here, but it's changing, honestly. I think people look at deals, or at least investors look at deals here on a deal-by-deal -deal basis, and they are unforgiving if the entrepreneur does, you know, doesn't kind of deliver or fails. Um, you know, in, uh, in, in San Francisco or in that part of the world, I would say, you know, failure is a badge of honor. Uh, and, and, and actually some venture capitalists look for entrepreneurs who have had a failure in the past because they know that they have, have, have learned some lessons. Um, so long, long answer to a short question, but essentially it's, it's, it's an educational, uh, po I would say, uh, ecosystem with good uh, technical universities. It's a legal framework and an intellectual capital that understands this, uh, this kind of investing. Thank you very much. The second question I had is that it was interesting. When you mentioned the two engineers you've met, you took them as advisors. You didn't take them as technical co-founders. So my question is, how and when do you decide that you want to work with someone as an employee or as an advisor rather than a co-founder? What would it take a technical person for you to perceive him as a co-founder? I think uh, a big part of, um, of bringing on a co-founder is trust. If you've known the person, you've worked with them for years, you understand their character, that, that defines a, a co-founder more than their technical or their sort of, their ex, sort of experience itself. Um, I see. So usually if you want to bring in a co-founder, it has to be something that is so important to the business that you want to have a stakeholder in the business as opposed to an employee. So the, the, the success of the business is, is partly kind of dependent on having that resource with you. And it's different when you bring in someone as a, as a co-founder as opposed to an employee. Not to say an employee is not important. We treat every employee that we bring on, on board as a partner. So every, you know, every one we hire, we, we give them a competitive benefit and salary package. We also give them equity in the company because that's, that's what retains them. Now, there are ways of kind of designing around that, but we think that uh, you know, having, having some, as they say, skin in the game is, uh, is important to retaining the talent that you'd like to keep around you. Uh, hi. I was wondering, since all the apps you've developed are uh, freeware apps, do you, or how much, precise, how much do you depend on in-app advertising? Uh, for us, uh, actually, we don't we don't uh, do advertising in in app. We did it for one one of our games, uh, but most of our uh, revenue is actually generated from in game purchases, uh, in app purchases, uh, premium currency. Um, I think different products and different even different games lend themselves to different business models. So for us, um, because we're focused on this part of the world, we understood that it only takes a small percent percentage of our players. Uh, to, to pay for us to, to make this a, a financial success. However, if we were building a game for a, a, a bigger audience, a bigger market such as Egypt, and maybe advertising would make more sense for us. 
So it's it's all about adapting to uh, to your market and understanding, you know, how to extract value from the market. Uh, quick question over here. Um, a lot of people want to be entrepreneurs. Uh, the question is, when do you recommend they become one? When do they jump into the deep end of entrepreneurship? You know, go all, all through those hardships to get to to where they want to be. Because you see a lot of people that jump into that and they come out with like not very positive <laughs> outcomes. And uh, on the flip side of the coin, a lot of people who jump into that also come out like as millionaires, obviously. So when is the right time is my question here. Um, there, there isn't really a, a right time. And I, I didn't feel like I was ready to, to make the jump until I you know, had, had someone or at least a, a collective of people that had trust in me and, and they kind of convinced me to do it. Um, I think you, you're the only one that knows if, if you're ready for it or not. Um, you're always going to have skill gaps that uh, that that makes you, that would make you believe that you're not ready to do it to to venture into entrepreneurship. Um, but you could always complement these gaps by hiring or ha working with people who are strong at them. You know, no one is is uh, you know is, is experienced in every single uh, functional area. Um, but you. I feel like you, you, you can make that jump when you're extremely convinced or confident in the skills that you have and confident in knowing how you take advantage or leverage those skills to making this business successful. Um, I think uh, a misconception that a lot of people have about entrepreneurship is doing something that you're passionate about. I agree with that, but it's not about just passion. It's doing something that you're really good at, right? And you're actually not just good at; you're great at, because that that's that's the distinction that you need to survive, uh, in, in, you know, uh, in this very competitive world of of whatever it is you're doing. Um, so as long as you have that edge, and you're confident of that edge, and you can, you're confident of putting together, you know, the the team that will help you kind of deliver the product that you want to build, then I think that's the answer. I think that's 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 essentially the the time for you to do it. But if, if if not, then you perhaps need need to find ways to to build up that skills. Um, over here. Okay. Um, so it's just a follow up question on a comment you made about uh, the market here kind of missing a lot of technical talent. Um, I see a lot of entrepreneurs here that have great ideas, and what they choose to do is instead. Uh, like opt in for either hiring a company or hiring like freelancers to create their apps. What are your thoughts on that just as like a way of going into business because it's kind of, I mean to me personally, it feels like a risky thing to do but I see a lot of people doing it and I'm just curious like what your thoughts are, are on that. Um, unknown fact but we still work with contractors uh, okay. and, and, and this is how I started the business is I, I worked with freelance or contracting companies to help me build my first product. So having a, a team of, you know, from the get-go is not uh, a requirement to starting a business. Now, um, you know, working with people that, again, I go back to the references point, working with people that have been referred to you is important because when you work with contractors, there's a risk that they will just drop the project or they will overcharge or just not deliver something that you want. And I think it's important for you to control that risk. So, you know, be it your friends or people you trust, or even Sardab Labs, uh, the entrepreneurs here, uh, if you get to know them and, and ask for their advice, uh, then that's, that's part of uh, kind of controlling the risk of, of starting the business and, and working with, with outsourced or freelancers. But uh, this is the beauty of, of starting a business today is that you know, not everyone has to be in the same location. You have the infrastructure, you have the technology that connects you with pretty much anyone in the world that at, this, at the right price is willing to make what it, whatever it is that you want to do. But you also can't um, fully outsource everything that, uh, that you want to build. You have to be involved. And uh, you know, just finding the right balance of, of being involved and delegating is important. So a question is, uh, is, is, this is not specific to your business, but in general, in this type of gaming, how much is the percentage of revenues from top players? So, that's in general. Uh, 
it, it's it's different, I guess, across the industry. Um, but in some instances, you would say, you know, your top players, and you define top as, let's say, top 10% sometimes. In some games we've seen, at least some of our games, we've seen top 10% making up about 50% of our revenue. Um, sometimes, you know, in, in some areas, it's 75%. Um, so it's for us that's that's risky. So finding a way to distribute that uh, that risk is really important. But um, you know we've seen some companies that also you know top five percent contribute fifty percent. That's it's uh, it's a changing formula. Thank you very much, Abdullah. It's been sure. a pleasure talking Thank to you. you. We've learned a lot. Great opportunity to hear Mr. Abdullah Zibin's uh, presentation tonight. Um, his experience uh, with uh, his entrepreneurial journey uh, was very enlightening, and uh, I think it's going to give a push for a lot of people that didn't have an, an idea how to go about it. Um, I think it's a very good um, lessons to be shared, and uh, he did a fabulous job in. Uh, saying the pros and cons of going into um, the gaming um, line of business and at the same time to be an entrepreneur such a very 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 tough uh, market so good job wonderful presentation and good luck to all who would follow his uh, footsteps thank you hi my name is Jared Willis from Berkeley Research Group I'm the country manager for our company we're opening an office in Kuwait next month uh, I'm very interested in this event and these events and the entrepreneurship community in Kuwait. Uh, we have a lot of uh, experts, experts and expertise in the area of entrepreneurship and we're trying to learn how we can help empower the entrepreneurs in Kuwait and improve the business environment. Uh, Sirdeb Labs is obviously a very uh, strong part of the local ecosystem with events like this bringing uh, entrepreneurs and other players in the community. Uh, I am personally very pleased to be uh, included in the event and to meet uh, all the wonderful entrepreneurs, motivated, uh, talented people that Kuwait has. And we are hoping to play a role in Kuwait, uh, encouraging startups to be based in Kuwait, not just have to come from Dubai in the United States to explain how they've succeeded here, but to help contribute to success stories here in Kuwait. So the event was very worthwhile. It's always important for entrepreneurs to share their experiences with other people because in the end, we learn through people's journeys, and it's important to know about not just successes, but also failures, and tonight's speaker really shared a lot, and we're very grateful to him, and this is a wonderful opportunity for Sadab Lab to showcase what it can do for Kuwaiti entrepreneurs. Hi, um, first time here at Startup Grind. Uh, it's really something really amazing. I, I didn't expect it to be this much of an open format, but it was glad, I was really happy that the audience got to ask a lot of questions. Even I got to ask a question, something I had always wanted to know about gaming. And it, because it's a very uh, open area, so I felt that the interviewee also got a chance to relax because he's not under a lot of pressure and asking and answering a lot of um, intimate questions about the nature of business and helping people understand what it takes uh, to reach a certain measure and level of success. Thank you. That was a great event, so it was extremely enjoyable. Uh, I love seeing such startup initiatives happening in Kuwait because it's something that's much needed. And it's always inspiring to talk uh, to entrepreneurs and hear them speak about their experiences. It's a huge boost in motivation. It was a great event, and I would like to attend it again. Thank you, Sir Dabla, for this event. Uh, hello, my name is Mohanad. I am around 20 years old. Today we've learned a lot about entrepreneurship and how development of an application works and what difficulties people go through and how business in this road goes and how marketing is really done. And it's not always success. You have to go through a lot of failures and a lot of hardships 
to get what you want and to get what you what you are looking for. Thank you. Tonight it was a wonderful uh, event. Uh, when I first came in here, uh, I see the the difference, the new look of Sardab Lab. I'm very happy for this, and uh, of course the. The startup grin uh, with uh, Mr. Abdullah Zevin, he gave uh, very valuable information about the business in general. And uh, I would like to thank everybody for doing this uh, and hope uh, they will uh, achieve uh, the best in their business. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, Sir Dabla for providing, providing us with this uh, wonderful opportunity. Uh, it was really informative. Uh, kind of meaning. Uh, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak at Sardab Labs. It was a, it was a great event, uh, great questions from the moderator and the audience. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm very happy to see something like this taking place in Kuwait. Uh, this is the start of building a great and vibrant ecosystem that I would love to be part of. Thank you.